Okay, recording has started. Okay, so I think we're ready to rock and roll. We're going to go to whichever slide we'll start on. Oh, if you switch to port 9009, it'll probably be more stable. The Etherpad goes through an Apache proxy, which apparently has to compete with uh, and Google indexing the site. And Warren is testing, and we have a, in case Warren is testing, to remind us to talk about both Q, we have that on the slide. So Barbara, you're are you stopped presenting or? Yeah, I'm presenting. Does it look like I'm presenting? Not to my view here. Anyone else? Oh, you took over. You took it away from me. Right. I need. I, I need to be presenter again. Sorry, yes, Jim. Your people are speaking. Uh, Jim is having audio. Yes. Barbara has the bubble. Okay, we're starting to see things again. Yeah. Okay. okay. And just going from the beginning. Okay, here we are. We're the HomeNet working group, not in Vancouver. Uh, no, well, and everybody has seen this over the last number of weeks as they were connecting to various ITF meetings. Administrivia, that's that. Okay, next slide, I guess. Okay, so here's the details on this call. Back one slide, please. Okay. Um, Please go to the Etherpad during the call at some point and put your name on the blue sheet there. Um, the link is posted in the Jabber chat again. Uh, can we get somebody to volunteer for minutes, helping with minutes? Um, yes, I will help with minutes. Okay. I'll be there too. Um, while we're doing that, could I get someone to communicate with Ted Lemon, who seems to not have the WebEx information? Yeah, I was trying to talk with him, but he seems to he he's going to the URL and he seems to get a password prompt. Yeah, I'm not getting any, any password prompt. Neither am I. What did I? Probably trying to run that Safari thing that apparently does not do very well with WebRTC. Mm. I've had multiple people say that in the last week. Okay, so we'll try to get Ted online to the call um, as we go. Um, okay, so the only thing to note here is that uh, we'd like you to uh, use the WebEx chat for the mic line and then use the Jabber chat for anything that's not involved in getting on the mic line. And when you get on the mic line, type plus Q into the WebEx chat. And then I'll, I'll, I, I think I'm running the WebEx mic line, Barbara, it's correct? Yes. Okay, so I will call you as needed. Uh, if you, I, the presenters will say if they want you to hold till the end of their presentation or, or if they're happy with interrupts. Um, so Michael or um, Daniel, whoever's doing the first one, can take that into account. If you get in the queue and then you want to get out of the queue, then use minus Q to take yourself off the queue. I hope that's fairly clear if you've probably been to some of these ITF things the last few weeks. Any questions on that logistics? Nobody typed plus Q, so I'm taking that as no questions. Uh, Warren had typed plus Q and minus Q earlier. I presume that was just a test. Uh, our agenda, we have an agenda batch. Uh, we're scheduled for 90 minutes, but we probably won't need it all. Uh, I think, Michael, or is it you or Daniel presenting um, on the front end naming delegation draft? And then Ted, assuming we can get him on the call, is presenting. And then we have any other business. This I is assume that Daniel was going to talk, but I mean, I could if he doesn't want to, but. 
Okay, so Ted has at least has appeared in Jabber. Uh, so we're assuming it's Daniel. Any uh, agenda bashing? No agenda bashing. So do you want to switch to the slide deck, Barbara? So, uh, can you hear me all? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start, and Michael, please jump into the conversation as um, as you wish. So, yeah, that's the outsourcing architecture. So this is where we are. Um, so basically, you have the HNA, HNA, which is the the box or the function responsible for handling your public home net zone. And the purpose is to to outsource this home net zone um, into an outsourcing infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the basic config configuration is a um, primary secondary um, configuration. So it's a very DNS configurator. And um, the synchronization between the, the two are uh, using what we call a synchronization channel. So that's the regular way we use to uh, synchronize primary and um, secondary. But to set this synchronization channel, um, we use what we call a control channel. And um, this one is basically agreeing all the necessary parameters you need for, for that syn synchronization to happen. Um, so, we so yeah so regarding this uh, control channel um the way we do that today is that we we wanted to reuse um um the dns libraries and to try as much as possible not to introduce additional libraries that we may not need um as a result i mean the kind of question we have between the HNA and the outsourcing architect infrastructure, which is, yeah, what kind of um, IP address should I use, or um, what is your uh, any kind of information that we we could use um, uh, a HTTP POST or HTTP GET? get. Um, we are instead using um, um, uh, DNS messages for doing it. So. Um, there is an agreement that uh, when the HNA is doing a NS uh, update, it should be interpreted as a, it could be interpreted as a HTTP post. And um, when he's uh, asking for an AXFR um, through this control channel, it's it's basically asking for an information. So all that to say that we have a special convention so that, that we can only use um, a DNS library. Um, maybe next slide. So, um, I mean, this DNS library goes over a TLS, so it's not a security issue at that point. But, um, and we have a proof of concept. So we have all the messages um, working on, but one of the questions that came, um, last week that um, if we don't have um, HTTP at all, um, we, we, we can may, maybe it's going to limit uh, um, um, how we could use OAuth, for example. So next slide. So, um, yeah, so it, it might be hard to, to use OAuth. So again, I'm, I'm going to repeat the reason we, we only wanted to have DNS is um, because we, since so we can make without, the, without HTTP, then um, we keep a single library. We don't uh, add extra libraries. And the, the, the I mean, adding a library uh, adds some um, um, surface of attacks, uh, cut complexity with HTTP because um, which version we're going to use. 
um, and so on and so on. So that's um, that's the the, the re reason we use only DNS. But now that's um, yeah, is that really a, a safe choice? Not having HTTP. So um, the downsides we see now is that uh, it might be harder to to have OAuth. So next slide. Why do we want OAuth? So the current scenario is um, that the user is um, connected through the web interface of his uh, HNA. He selects a compatible DNS provider. He buys the domains and uh, processes the payment. And from that um, DNS provider, he get a, a link that is going to copy paste um, into its um, into um, the HNA, and that um, web link is is um, having all the necessary information um, for the HNA to be uh, configured properly. Um, so, the OAuth could be used to prevent to have this um, copy paste face, and um, to completely to improve the automation for that. So the, the end user will go to the web interface of the home router, select the DNS provider, buy the domain, and uh, be automatically be redirected back to the home router. So yeah, so that's the, basically the motivation to have something completely automated. So um, yeah, so the question we have now is that um, between the HNA and the distribution master, which um, is the entry point of the um, outsourcing infrastructure, we use DNS and TLS. And so um, the user use HTTPS to communicate with the HNA, so that's the router, and use HTTPS to communicate with the register. So basically the question is that, could we do DNS over TLS without any HTTP? Um, so one 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 way to we one one way of seeing this is that DNS can run over HTTPS, so um, that would be one way to integrate OAuth. But then, if we're doing it, then why did we have this um, complex exchange uh, using a specific DNS convention? Um, and uh, why couldn't we simply leverage from HTTP? Um, and the, so, so that's when the question opened, and I'm happy to take any feedbacks from um, what people think. Um, but the other thing is that we also saw that uh, we, we may simply uh, benefit from OAuth um, on a regular TLS session, so mutually um, authenticated uh, TLS uh, going through certificates. So that's currently what we are looking at. So my um, my expectation is that we, we I, I think, well, what we would like is to describe in the document how we use OAuth. And um, if we could use OAuth without um, any change with what is currently being designed, um, I think that would be um, better. Otherwise, um, we would probably need to change um, the current draft and to integrate Exchange through um, taking advantage of HTTP. Um, so yeah, so I think that's the last slide. Next slide. Yeah, so that was the last slide. So I'm happy to take any feedbacks on um, whether it's safe to to do something without a HTTP um, or um, if it's something, something that we should not even uh, wonder, HTTP is going to be in all those devices, and we can't uh, leverage from those. Um, yeah, that's uh, basically what we are waiting for um, from the working group to to understand where what's going to be our next step. So our our co-author um, um, Ray um, is not joined us. Um, and he actually let us know that he's unwell, um, unknown whether he's got the COVID or not. Um, but I thought he was going to join us today, and he actually did the the 
did the the reference design that and he found the DNS to be much easier than the other stuff. But on the other hand, he's a DNS guy. Um, and so it was not so surprising that it was his, he likes DNS. Okay, so uh, this is me as chair. Just if you want to get in the mic line, then type plus Q in the WebEx chat. Uh, me as not as chair is in the queue, but I'll let Ted go first. So Ted. Do you have audio? Okay, maybe I'll go first while Ted yes, on. Yes, I have audio. Sorry, oh, the go. problem is I. Cool. Okay, cool. The usability on this stuff is amazingly bad. I can't be in the chat and talking at the same time. It's like what? Anyway, um, so the question is: um, Is there is there a case where you need to be originating an HTTP connection from? uh from the isp to the user i don't think so okay so we we originate the the axfr is a is a transfer and it does originate from the distribution master to the uh the home router that's for sure but that's the that's the but that's to the outside of the router and that's to what the whole that's what the whole set up is to indicate where that is. Okay, so the reason I'm asking is because um, anytime that you have a home router uh, that's accepting an HTTP connection, um, you have to no, deal with it's the a PKI DNS. issue. It's a DNS issue. It's an AXFR. Okay, if it's just an AXFR, that's fine. I was just, I was just concerned about the HTTPS part. No, there isn't. Okay, thanks. Okay, seeing nobody else ahead of me, I'm I'm in queue then. So I, I'm not I'm maybe not following this correctly, but when you say using DNS over HTTPS, that means DOE, I assume. Yeah. And is the implication here that you want DOE with client authentication somewhere? Yes. Okay, so that's probably an anti pattern for DOE. We, we, we in in some sense we do not oh. want DNS over HTTPS service that that try or are capable of identifying the clients and tracking them. So fair enough, but we're not doing DNS requests. We're actually doing DNS updates. Yeah, but it's a HTTPS kind of function, right? Well, so we're, we're, we're not doing it to the ISP's uh, DOE server. We're doing it to the, uh, we're doing uh, uh, DNS to the, uh, uh, what may not be the ISP, it's the, 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 the the domain server service is um, um, distribution master. And we're doing it so that we can do a DNS update. So we can basically update the NS record that 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 um, the they're going to use to pull uh, to the XFR from. So we have to authenticate somehow. And if we don't do it with a client certificate, then we would be doing it with a TSIG and that doesn't seem to be an, an an improvement but um steven i think what you're saying is um so basically for us the the reason so yeah the dns over https would be mutually authenticated right so so my my, my point is not that this might not work my point is that, that having dns over https servers that can even perform client authentication could be considered an anti-pattern because if that code became the yeah. common use case then tracking uh using doe would become more threatening than currently is the case i think um i, I hear so you what I, you I, I think you take your point so so one of the one of the possible what we want is a pattern that allows us to provide that access token that comes from oauth that essentially binds the client certificate to the TLS connection. The only reason why we're looking at HTTP at all is because that's one way of, of carrying that token. Um, and if there was some expertise in 8705, 
It's unclear to us whether that allows us to carry the token in a TLS container rather than in an HTTP uh, JSON container. If so, then we could do DNS over TLS as we expected to do. But um, I think what Steve is saying is that if we are doing DNS over HTTPS, not though, but DNS over HTTPS with a mutually authenticated um, uh, TLS session, then um, it's likely that um, a door server will use the same settings and uh, uh, put the HNA at risk. But it, the distribution master is never, ever going to be a public Doe server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's got to be a different machine for a lot of different reasons. I, I, I love your crystal balling. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I, I think the thing for this is that that, that, that relationship between DNS and HTTPS and client authentication probably needs a few more eyeballs at it before you'd really want to push it forward. I think that's maybe a summary. That's we, 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 don't, we don't want to go the HTTPS route, okay, actually. We, we would prefer to stick with DNS over TLS, I think. Um, and uh, but we don't know how to get an OAuth uh, process uh, to work through that uh, there. Okay, so there's an issue to, to try and figure. Okay, uh, we'll see. Warren is in queue, and Jim. Then Warren first. Thanks, Warren Kamari. Um, so yeah, DNS over HTTPS or DNS over TLS. Both of those were specifically, or one of the main. Um, justifications from there was to improve privacy. And so putting this stuff in, um, even though it's not going to be for public servers, I think will make people very twitchy. Um, you know, the very idea of carrying something which completely exposes who you are into protocols which were largely designed for privacy enhancements, I think will make people very unhappy and you're going to get a lot of pushback. Um, using a completely different protocol, custom rolled, just for this, seems like it might be a better idea. Uh, but that's wow, really? you know, political. <laughs> so you're happy with us kind of abusing DNS in this way? No, I think that's exactly what I was not saying. OK. So you want us to do something else? Yeah. Or um, you're going to have to justify really hard to a lot of people why you're taking a privacy enhancing protocol and removing the privacy part. And yes, it makes sense in this case, but I think mentioning that is going to make people's heads explode. If we go to a straight HTTPS with client authentication and no DNS at all, then you're okay with it? Um, this isn't so much me. As I'm asking I for your, your view of the world, really, yeah. Yeah, I would think some other protocol just for this um, might make might be a lot easier path for you to walk. And uh, then we have Jim and followed by Ted. So Jim is in the queue. Thanks, Stephen. My question is similar to the one that at, um, Warren just raised. If we've got can, you've raised concerns about the possibility of door being used for the mechanisms, but wouldn't those concerns equally apply to using DOT? Yes, that's true. So, Jim, your video just finally struggled through. I think. It, I think you got an answer, but jump back in the queue if not. I did get an answer, thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't realize the video was on. Uh, that's fine, it just popped up briefly. Uh, Ted, you're in queue. Okay, so um, a couple things. One, uh, it turns out, so you don't need to use TSIG. You could use SIG0, which is which is uh, asymmetric key, um, and help with figuring that out. That was exciting. If you need help figuring that out, um, I can maybe participate in that. Secondarily, um, TLS has the ability to use client certs. I don't know, uh, why, why would you want to use OAuth in this case? 
So, so the, the, protest, be there? the protest that that I think is is pretty uh, would make a lot of sense is that um, OAuth lets we we have this problem of a home home network uh, a home router and it needs to be authorized to talk to the uh, the the, the uh, service that's hosting your zone. Okay, um, and yes, understood. Yeah. Okay, so that's something you probably set up from your browser or phone, okay, um, with your credit card, et cetera. And that the best flow would be is if you actually initiated that from the home router, such that you basically wound up with an OAuth flow that you know, where essentially the, the home router says, I would like to be able to access uh, whatever, GoDaddy, okay, and it comes back and you go to GoDaddy and you get an authorization token and it goes back to the home router. And that's an OAuth flow. It's fairly well established. That's how it works. Okay. The problem is, is that then when the home router wants to talk to the service, um, it needs to be able to present that authorization token somehow. That's essentially right. a signature from the service saying the home router's certificate is authorized to talk to the service. Right. So I I, I, I I get that, but the problem I have with that is that it's needlessly complicated. I mean, OAuth is this incredibly complex and wonderful protocol. It's designed specifically for doing a particular kind of authentication that you don't need here. What? Um, why? I would like to to think why you think we don't need it. So the reason I think you don't need it is because you already have to have established, uh, you you've already established trust in the browser. So now the the flow that like, so those of us who've already set up DNSSEC, and I assume you've done this, so you know how this goes, right? The flow that you use for DNSSEC is you log into your registrar yeah. and you copy and paste in your DS record, at which point you're done. Because the, the, thing, that, the thing that has this, the, the, the private key that is used to sign the zone um, can just be authenticated using the DS record. So, so you, you're using OAuth in the case where OAuth makes sense, which is in the web browser, and you're using the DS record in the case where that makes sense, which is for the for the uh, for the DNS transaction. So we actually have CDS records now. Um, so uh, the the DS record actually could be retrieved by the service if it knew where this the service was coming from and could trust it. So you wouldn't even have to copy and paste necessarily but, but, if you could inform the thing in a trustworthy okay. way right so so in other words when you log in you put in the information and it says you know is this the correct ds record i just got it from your cds i think you're better off cutting and pasting it from a, from a security point of view because i just don't i just I mean, can't imagine that being workable for average guy Yeah, but if so, so there's some magic going on here to get the OAuth token into the router. So yes. if you can do that magic, then you can also do the DS record magic. Well, that's in the just other a direction. post. That's just a post on an administrative interface of the home router, right? No, 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 no. The home the the home router has to have the OAuth token. Yes, which it gets from router. your browser. That's the OAuth flow. How did it get right? it from the browser? That's the OAuth flow. How did it get it from the browser? You want me to explain OAuth? No, I, I understand the basic idea of OAuth, but there is a step. I, that I don't think you do out. because it starts with the with the client, which in this case is the home router, essentially causes the browser to redirect to the service. The service says, Do you want to authorize this? And if and if you say yes, then the service mm -hmm. redirects you back to the home router. How does it know to do that? Because the home router told it where to come back to. And when it does that, it appends a jot to the, the, the thing, and that essentially gets posted to the home router. And then the home router has a jot which it processes, and in that is the authorization token that it uses. So that's right. so, how it gets so, back. So why, what I'm getting at is that that's actually, you're, you're saying that as if that's really simple, but it's actually quite complicated. Um, well, well and... I'm not disagreeing with you that there are many moving parts, um, but I am suggesting that it's a solved problem. And I don't know how to solve it in a simpler fashion than, than that. 
Well, what, what I'm saying is that, is that essentially a, a, an almost identical flow would work perfectly fine for delivering the DS key to the right place. I, we could design that. Yeah. I mean, it just like using OAuth here, it's, you know, I, I get that there's this chicken and egg problem. And, and you're trying to solve the chicken and egg problem by stuffing OAuth into the home. Well, I think this way. I think that it's it's the, the the path of least resistance for the service provider, who probably already does OAuth for a bunch of other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's relatively easy for uh, the uh, home router designer or vendor to be able to say, "Oh, I I need these three Python libraries, and I'm done." And the rest is some JavaScript that runs in the browser. Right, which isn't code that you load anyway in your browser. That, that's why I'm thinking that OAuth is an important thing here. If you think that's not important, I'm I'm willing to listen to that. Okay, if you, uh, the alternative yeah, is. I mean, I, I think I think it would be worth paste. at least I think it would be worth at least exploring what it would look like to use DS for this instead of OAuth because. When I think about how to actually code this and make it work in a home router, which is really important, um, it doesn't really sound like it's easy. And, okay, you know, maybe so, that's just that I don't. You know, sorry, go ahead. So, so Ray implemented this uh, not with Sig Zero, but with DNS client authentication for the 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 uh, for that part, not using HTTPS or OAuth. But that assumes that the home router has pre uh, has pre-configured its key somehow, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are some cases where that's true, where the vendor of the home router is going to be the service provider, and they can actually pre-built that key in at manufacturing time. Um, so, so that's a that that doesn't require an OAuth flow, but that also doesn't scale to every manufacturer and every service provider, and doesn't give us flexibility of having different service yeah. providers. And it also has fixed keys, which I'm certainly not arguing for. Well, it's a no no more fixed. It's an it's an IDEV ID certificate, right? Which yeah. not a necessarily a TSIG uh, a key. It's a symmetric asymmetric key, um, and we could arrange an update for it if we had to. Once it's trusted, Fair enough, but. Yeah, but but I mean the the, the I, I think having a long discussion about this here is probably pointless. But I think it would be worth at least sketching out what the flow would look like for use for setting up a DS record as opposed to for using OAuth because I think that it's easier than you think it is. Well, I, I thought it was quite s s simple too myself, um, and that was my original proposal, um, and I felt like I had a lot of pushback on this. Hmm. Okay. Oh, but you're trying to update an NS record um, and a DS record in the distribution master, which is not the one that's going to be published. That's going to be confusing. Because remember, this is the stealth primary. The NS record's not going into the public zone. So you actually have to do a, an NS update to essentially to a, non, a zone that is not really the public zone. So you're basically already into views on the distribution master or something that pretends to be a DNS server but isn't really a DNS server. Really, a I database. Think, I just had a question there. Did, did I don't recall that discussion from the mailing list? Am I am I right or, or wrong? Well, um, I think I got a lot of pushback privately. So, um, yeah. um, but okay. yeah, so, fair enough. Um, so, what's the what's the way forward with this discussion? To, I mean, how do we craft this discussion in a way? Well, I I think that we should we we need to uh, first of all. The first question is, and, and 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 I don't know whether this is the thing. I need to find some expertise on 80, 8705 or read it a lot more intimately than I did already to understand whether we can. There's a way to carry an OAuth token inside TLS rather than inside HTTPS. So that if that is the case, then it opens up a bunch of possibilities that 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 didn't exist before, right? Um, that's I, I, not I, how it works, and my trivial reading says it's not how it works. That well, I'm it not says aware that there is such a thing. Yeah. So my reading of it is that it allows you to send an OAuth token within HTTPS that uh, authenticates the client certificate used for that HTTPS, right? 
That's what my reading of it is says. So that doesn't help us unless we move to HTTPS. Um, so then we have to design some other flow that comes back and essentially uh, provides uh, for that um, public key of the home router to go through the browser to the service provider uh, to get to be locked down properly, right? And, and maybe we can do that anyway. So um, having done that, um, you know, we can describe a, a flow which may look like OAuth or may not look like OAuth, um, but then the update side of it could be DS or not, right? And I think those are two separate discussions. Do, do you understand, Ted? Yeah, I agree. So, so what's the action here? Is to bring that discussion to the list or? Yeah. So, but the other thing I did hear from this is that the working group is relatively happy with the fact that we're doing the the control channel setup using DNS rather than HTTPS. That's what I also heard, <laughs> which is surprising to me because I didn't think that it was going to be well taken. Yeah, I mean, we have all of this fun technology in DNS, like. Why not use it? That was my original thing. Hey, it's just a DNS update. You just got to authenticate it properly. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part is that also is that the 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 uh, DHCP, the reverse zone, well, those authentication tokens or authorization tokens come in DHCP v6 with the prefix delegation. So there's no flow to deal with. So it, it just becomes pure DNS. For that side. Okay, so then, so the, so next steps are to send that synopsis to the to the list. Is that right? And, and with the open question as to how do you do that authentication or authorization stage? Yeah, and and I think we have to describe the OAuth flow, uh, the possible OAuth flow, a little bit more clearer, um, so that we can can be understood whether this is desirable or not. Yeah, and, and yeah. <laughs> OAuth is notoriously easy to misunderstand. So yeah, maybe give some thought to how you can best do that that people might understand it on the list. But... Okay, I don't see anybody else in the queue. And uh, I think we have a couple of actions identified there. Michael, is it you that's taking those actions to, to bring stuff to the list? I guess so. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of actions, discussions should follow on the list. Um, anything else on this topic? Hearing nothing, I think our next... Daniel yeah. says his mic is broken. Ah. Well, that's convenient. Says he's fine with these actions to be taken on the list. Okay. Okay, great. Cool. Thanks, Diane. Uh, and then I think that brings us to Ted. Yep. So uh, I'm a little tempted to try and use uh, my device to present this, but if you guys are okay with driving, maybe that's faster. It's already up, Ted. All right. We're on slide okay, so, <laughs> so so basically, what's what I wanted to talk about here is that you know there's this um, there's a lot of work going on in the sort of constrained network part of the IETF on dealing with uh, what uh, uh, would prefer us to call stub networks. Um, I also call them leaf networks. Basically, networks that connect to some existing network in order to provide uh, connectivity to uh, to constrained device device networks the sort of networks that the six low group manages and so the six low group came out with this thing called the six low backbone router um, and uh, I've been aware of the six bone six low backbone router since about Prague uh, and I was not thrilled with the way it was designed but um, when I back on it, I got a surprising amount of resistance, or maybe not surprising, I don't know. Um, and 
You know, their, their solution is basically to make the six low network, make devices on a six low network appear as if they are on the backbone network. Um, and the way they do that is by doing proxy neighbor discovery. Um, Michael, did you want to join in? Um, I just wanted to say that that I think it, it, it's be more properly to call it this um, Pascal Tubel's um, uh, drive. Um, he represents a num great number of people outside the IETF and industrial networking. Um, and that uh, I, I don't think that there's a huge amount of understanding of it within the IETF period, even though it's been around and I think it's in last call now or it's past last call. Um, Absolutely. but well, I think it's, it's been idea. tolerated because it's for those weird industrial IOT people. That's sort of true, but let me, let me go a little farther down this, down this rat hole. If you'll, if you'll forgive me. Um, so can we go to the next slide? The, the reason I say that is because, uh, Pascal is not the only person provide, pr proposing solutions to this problem. And as far as I can tell, nobody is proposing using routing to solve this problem, which makes me very sad. So let me describe what this solution looks like, and why it's good. Okay. So um, what's great about this solution, Pascal's solution, is that all devices on the stub network, well, actually, this part isn't that great. All devices on the stub network are numbered from the prefix of the infrastructure network. And here we're assuming that the infrastructure network is a single network. Okay. Um, in order for this to work, all of the edge routers have to have a, an accurate list of all the devices on the stub network. Um, and Benefits are that, that it basically just looks like the devices are on your network. So service discovery using MDNS works. Uh, there's, you know, you don't have to do anything special with routing. Uh, devices can reach the internet. Internet can reach internet. The internet can reach the devices. Devices can communicate with each other. There's like full flow in all directions. Uh, there's no address translation. There's no IPv4 legacy support. So these are like good things, right? We like these things for the most part. The, the top two items I'm not so fond of, but but everything else is good. Um, and so when I was trying to, to talk Pascal out of this, my uh, assumption was, well, it would work better if we just did routing. And then I went and actually looked at what it would take to deliver that. So uh, can we go to the next slide? And then I was like, actually, I, I didn't think this, this is a modest proposal. I just. I'm throwing this in here because like, you know, we didn't solve the home net problem this way and there's a reason. Next slide. So uh, other solutions. Uh, one of the solutions that's been proposed in, in different working, different SDOs is to just use NAT64. So basically you've got um, a stub network, the edge router does NAT translation so that, so that um, Devices on the stub network get just use the IPv6 address, or sorry, IPv4 address of the stub router to communicate with cloud services. Um, another option is to actually just say, screw it, we're going to set up a fully managed routed IPv6 network. So every stub router is just an IPv6 router. Uh, we manage the routing tables however we manage them, and it all works and life is good. Michael? Um, I wouldn't say NAT64 is a solution. I would say NAT64 is um, a workaround because no one has knows what the other yeah, solution is and there wasn't any V6. Bear with me. Um, so another solution is to just use our... So all of these are stub networks, right? We're, we only need to get from the backbone to the stub network. We don't have to do anything fancy here. We don't need a fancy routing protocol. So in principle, you could just advertise reachability using router advertisements. So that's an option. Another option is to use HNC, HNCP and Babel, basically to use the protocols that we came up with in HomeNet to solve this problem. And, and the protocols that we came up with are highly applicable to this use case, right? I don't think anybody here would argue with that, but there might be issues with using them, but, but in principle, they solve the problem. Next slide. Oh, and of course, other solutions. I don't know what those would be. So uh, just to talk about NAT64 a little bit, um, so each stub network has its own prefix. Prefixes can be ULAs. Doesn't matter because we're not exposing on the internet. Um, every stub network just lo looks like a single device, a single IPv4 address. Um, service discovery doesn't work with MDNS. 
uh, you don't have to make any changes in the routing system though. So this is plug and play, which is a really big plus. Like that's, that's a plus of Pascal's solution as well. Um, so uh, devices can reach the cloud. The cloud cannot reach devices. Um, devices, I said yes for device to infrastructure, but that's actually, oh yeah, yeah, no, that works. So, so devices can talk to things that are on the infrastructure network. Uh, the infrastructure network can't easily talk to devices on the stub networks. It's possible to finesse that with some fancy footwork. Uh, you can you can have the same way that you can connect to things through a NAT, but it's certainly not easy and it's not plug and play. Uh, device to device communication works on the same stub network, but there's no way to talk between devices on a different stub network. So if you have a light switch in the garage, that's not going to be operating something in the house probably. Um, and of course, downsides, uh, the downside is that this, a downside is that this requires us to use address translation and uh, a plus is that it allows us to operate on IPv4 only networks of which there are many. Um, so that's, that's my spiel about NAT64, next slide. I think that covered everything that you were objecting to, right, Michael? Yeah, yeah. So uh, managed routed IPv6, obviously this is like the, the Cadillac solution, right? Every stub network has its own prefix. You can use ULAs, you can use GUA, GUAs, it doesn't really matter. It, it just depends on what you want to have happen. Um, service discovery using MDNS unfortunately doesn't work because MDNS is a single subnet solution. Um, somebody has to actually manage this network, right? It's a routed managed IPv6 network. Um, the reachability story is really good. If you've got GUAs, you can talk to the internet, the internet can talk to you. Your devices can talk to infrastructure devices, infrastructure devices can talk to your devices, devices can talk to each other, totally full reachability. Uh, we don't need address translation. Uh, if we did need IPv4 legacy support, um, that could be supported by putting NAT64 in the edge router. Or if you don't have IPv4, on the infrastructure network, which doesn't really make sense in this case, but if you didn't, then then you could put it on the on the uh, stub routers. But that doesn't. That's basically NAT sixty four only, so that doesn't really help. All right, so that's that solution. Next slide. Okay. So stub reachability using router advertisements. Basically, the idea here is that your um, your stub router. Um, is connected to the infrastructure network and it just advertises reachability to the um, to the stub network to the prefix on the stub network. So it just sends out an RA. Uh, the RA has uh, doesn't probably doesn't need to have a PIO unless you're um, a prefix information option unless you're unless the network is an IPv4 only network. Um, but it would advertise a router information option and it would advertise itself as not a default router. So router lifetime equals zero. Um, and, uh, so that's, that kind of solves the problem. If all you really need to do is communicate within, within the, you know, in our case that within the home, right. Um, you know, it's plug and play. You just plug the, you plug the stub router into your home network and things kind of automatically work. Um, you can use ULA, so you don't need IPv6 connectivity to the internet. And in fact, it, it's actually kind of hard to get IPv6 connectivity to the internet using this technique. Um, you still don't get service discovery using MDNS. Um, you don't have to make any changes in your in your infrastructure routing unless you want to use GUAs. Uh, you have, if you figure out a way to use GUAs, which is a big if, then you you have device to internet and internet device connectivity, but most likely you don't have that. Um, Device to infrastructure, infrastructure device, no problem. Device to device, same network, no problem. Device to device, different network, also no problem. Assuming that the, that the backbone network is a single network and that multicast, there's full multicast reachability because what that means is that each of the stub routers will see all the other stub routers. And so they'll all recognize that there's reachability to those stub prefixes. Um, you don't need address translation for this. Uh, if you wanted address translation, you could put a NAT64, you could basically have you could combine this with the NAT64 solution and that would get you your IPv4 legacy support. Um, so there are some good things to say about this solution. It's not ideal, it doesn't solve every problem, but it, it does give you plug and play and, and it gives you plug and play on existing networks. So that's kind of cool. 
Next slide. Okay, so, and then uh, sub reachability using HNCP and Babel. Um, this is kind of like the managed case, except that you, you don't have to manage it, right? It's plug and play. So again, every stub network has its own prefix. Topology is automatically managed. You can use ULAs or GUAs. You don't have to do any special magic to use GUAs because that's, that's supported by HNCP. Um, service discovery using multicast DNS won't work. Uh, although <laughs> there's a, there's a, hopefully, a, a an addendum to that. Um, so, uh, actually this, this bullet item, the no special requirements is a mistake that I, I basically copy pasted these and then edited them. And I forgot to take that out. You don't have any special requirements for the infrastructure routing system, except it, it has to support HNCP. If you want to use GUAs, you can actually use HNCP and Babel on your home network, even if your edge router doesn't support it. Right. It just means that you're not going to get GUAs. You still have ULAs. So you can still have a lot of the functionality that you want. Um, but if your edge router supports HNCP, life is really good. Okay. So, uh, you know, in, in that case, you get device to internet and internet to device. That's great. Um, if you don't have HNCP on the edge router, you don't get that. Um, you do get device to infrastructure and infrastructure to, to device, uh, device to device, same stub, device to device, different stub that all works. So, uh, so this is, this is, um, arguably like there's it's arguably better than the than the previous use case right because you're getting basically all the same things that you were getting in the previous use case plus some extra functionality you don't need address translation again we can do ipv6 legacy support with nat64 at the edge um so so this is a pretty good solution next slide i'm claiming it's a pretty good solution um so why am I telling you all of this, right? This is mom and apple pie. We all know that HNCP and Babel is the best thing since sliced bread. The problem is it hasn't caught on. Like nobody's using it. Pascal didn't propose using it. Right? It would have solved this problem, but he didn't propose using it. Um, now I, I get he's doing industrial networks, so HNCP industrial. It's kind of a weird mesh. I, I understand why he didn't use it, but this isn't. Be, I haven't heard anybody propose this as a serious solution, and that frustrates me. Um, and uh, also, just generally speaking, like I haven't heard anybody propose a solution for supporting stub networks that isn't a flat topology. Michael, so uh, um, I, I first I'll just say that I, I I guess I read all your slides already. Sorry, I didn't know where you're going, but I want to say <laughs> um, um, so, so I so don't take this as criticism. But um, so a reason why HNCP Babel is not being is not of interest to Pascal is because he has devices that can migrate from stub network to stub network. And he would like to allow them to do that without having to renumber and reestablish their relationships with stuff. So that's why he, he wants that. And and one of the reasons essentially he's solving the uh the I'm walking around my house and I have to be on different access points what uh what is it easy mesh solves for wi-fi he needs to solve it for 802 uh 15.4 and so that's right. why it's not a it's not being considered as a possibility although mm -hmm. babel could route slash 28s 128s and we've discussed this in this working group as a possibility um um yeah if so i mean i haven't really gotten into the whole problem of what if the, what if the stub networks are actually a mesh network that's kind of got varying topology which i think is what you're talking about right yes and that that's that's and and neighbor discovery on the backbone network solves that problem and he also mm. defends the addresses so that you can't steal each other's addresses and stuff like this um and it it, it kind of solves the problem but there's a lot of work you have to do between the there, sub routers to make it all work there is and there is and and the other thing that maybe this working group isn't aware is that his backbone network contains deterministic ethernet in an industrial setting. And so he's actually getting uh, guaranteed latency and uh, uh, bandwidth things end to end, despite crossing multiple la different layer twos. Yeah, so let me, let me just emphasize here that my goal in describing what I'm describing here is not to bash Pascal's solution. Um, I'm using Pascal's solution as a jumping off point because 
it, I think really nicely, like identifies some of the things that, 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 uh, some of the problems that we haven't entirely solved here. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and the, 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 uh, the, the mesh problem is, 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 is a really hard problem. Like the, the, the potentially varying mesh topology problem where you have a mesh that's sometimes one mesh and sometimes two meshes. And, you know, sometimes there's a device that's, that, that wanders from mesh to mesh. It's, it's, a, it's a nasty problem, but, you know, it, I think what I what, the reason why I'm presenting this is because I, I kind of want to raise people's awareness about the sorts of problems that people are facing, and I I'd really like us to get to the point where we know where we can honestly look someone in the eye and say yes, we have a way to do plug and play stub networks, and and I don't think we have that right now. Like even the RA solution that I proposed. Um, which just uses existing IETF technology. It's, you know, whether, whether the devices on your link will actually be able to make use of what you're, what's being advertised is an open question to me. So, so that's really, my goal here is, to, is, is I think this is a really important problem. Um, and I'm not saying that Pascal hasn't solved the problem in a way that works for him, but I am saying that we as HomeNet you know, maybe ought to be thinking about how to solve this problem in the home, which is a different use case than Pascal's use case, so that we don't wind up with either the NAT64 solution that I described, which is kind of ugly uh, and, and limited, and, and limited in its, in its applicability and also has nasty privacy implications, right? If you use NAT64, you have to use a cloud service, or you have to have some kind of home cloud service, but, but it's not a great answer. Um, so, you know, if we really want to have the nice, happy IPv6, you know, full routing thing, we've got work to do. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So, so this is kind of like the, 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 uh, call to action. Um, I think that HNCP and Babel would solve this problem, but. You know, personally, if I were if I were advocating a solution to this problem, I wouldn't right now be advocating HNCP and Babel because we don't actually have running code that 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 is plug and play in practice. Um, home routers don't have this. Um, I think if somebody wanted to come up with a with a with their own point product for this, for 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 doing uh, stub networks in a home. They could, they could take HNCP and Babel and build a solution with that, but talking them into it would be pretty hard because there's just, you don't have a demo. Like, like we, in order to be able to demo this and, and have it make sense, it has to be a little bit more believable than, than, than what we currently have. Um, Another thing that we could do is actually like really walk into the router advertisement solution and explore that and describe what that would look like. Um, we talked about this previously when we were trying to come up with a routing protocol. Um, I, I looked into this a bit. It's pretty obvious that there are some gaps. Um, I think it would be worth doing a gap analysis. On the other hand, as I say here on the slide, maybe it's just a bad idea. So, so I'm, I'm curious to get feedback from people on that. Um, and then, uh, next slide. The other thing that I wanted to talk about, and I didn't really go into any detail about this because I think it's pretty obvious, uh, any solution that is not, uh, a flat topology is lacking a service discovery solution, right? Like we don't have a, we don't have a plug and play service discovery solution for finding devices on other networks on, on stub networks. Um, we, I mean, the ITF in general, HomeNet has been working on that problem. And I think we came up with some, some ideas that got us a lot closer to that, but we haven't finished that work. And, and of course, since I'm the main author of that work, um, I am largely to blame. Um, I've done some prototyping there actually in the last, uh, hackathon that I attended, um, I was hoping that we could we could work together on the stuff that I've that I published on the hackathon uh, 
uh, GitHub repo. So we do actually have code that does this, um, but we don't have specs that are complete. So uh, that's an interesting problem that I think it would be worth digging into. And I'm just saying this here, kind of A, to motivate myself, but B, uh, you know, I can't do this work on my, basically if nobody else is interested in this, then it's a little weird for me to come in and say, hey, let's standardize it. So, uh, so I'm hoping that there are other people who are interested in this problem as well. Um, I can't remember if there's another slide after this. That would be a no. Think, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. So I guess we should probably just go to questions now. Looks like that's Michael. Um, Michael. So, um, hi, did it work? Hi. Yeah. Am I talking? You are. Okay. All right. I just wasn't sure. Um, so, um, my understanding is that the, one of the advantages of the proxy ND solution, and I, and I think that one reason we didn't consider it back, you know, at the beginning of HomeNet is because it didn't exist and it wasn't clear that it was really a thing. Um, um, one of the reasons why I think it's really interesting is because, uh, yes, it does make MDNS work, which means that it just works with uh, stock desktops today. Um, and because it's proxy ND, it just works with stock desktops today. Just boom, it, it, it's an easy demo. No one even has to even know that it's on a separate network. So that's, as you say, it makes a really easy way to demo. You plug this thing in and there's 27 light bulbs attached to it. And boom, they're all visible to uh, everyone who's on that network. Um, and the other other thing about it is that is that because it's probably in the in the proxy ND case going in and out of out, out of uh, constrained network is there's no loops. There's no way that you're connecting. Uh, you're making an MDNS loop, and therefore the, you can do proxy MDNS, which is a bit of a hack. But you can do that, and you can cache in that in that edge router as well. So you don't even have to at, have the queries go all the way to the device, which might be sleeping uh, and and can answer. And then we get into some of the more service discovery things. And maybe we can find a, a and I think the answer is yes, we can find a, a, a nice transition from that to a full DNS SD solution that kind of just incrementally grows. And I think that's why it's such a, a nice thing, as you said, for stub networks. And I think that's a, a, a really uh, powerful, um, um, reason um and you know um and it also seems like it doesn't it it doesn't have to be it can run in parallel with uh hncp Babel, and so it actually doesn't it's not really a competition for that so there are a couple of things about what you said that i think need a little bit more digging into, and this is part of why I wanted to bring this up, because I think there, is, there are some, uh, like, you know, when I first looked at this, I just thought, oh, wow, this is easy. We already have a solution to this problem. Um, and then when I actually looked at the, at the details, I was like, oh, wow, no, there are some gaps. So two gaps that in, 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 in what you just said. One is um, neighbor discovery is a lazy protocol. So you don't maintain like, like if I'm a host on an IPv6 link with an on-link prefix, I do not maintain a table of all of my neighbors on that, on that link. I only maintain a table of neighbors that I have heard from because they're communicating or neighbors that I need to communicate with so that I've gone out and probed for them, right? I don't know about any other neighbors than that. There could be, I could have a, a neighbor table that's got like 1% of the devices on the network or 100% of the devices on the network. And which of those it's going to be is entirely dictated by what traffic has been flowing. And it turns out that that's actually the way multicast DNS works as well. So multicast DNS is not a published protocol. Multicast DNS is a query protocol. If you want to discover a service, you ask if there's a service available on the network using a multicast and you just sit there and listen to the responses and you send out you know, th three tries over the course of about six or eight seconds and 
And during that time, you just collate all of the responses. And then that's what you know about what services are available on the network. So there isn't a way to enumerate all the services on the network using MDNS. So these are both very similar situations. And um, I think the reason that Pascal's solution works for him is actually that um, it's, I think he's using a network where um, the edge router actually really does know everything that's connected to the mesh. And so, yes, it does. so for, and, right. and not so only for that, but it has a works. registration protocol. So, yeah. so the, the, the name, the, 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 um, uh, there, there is in fact a, a duplicate address detection protocol that has a registration. In fact, so that edge device, uh, that uh, stub router, um, actually does have a database of everything that's behind it, and it's not right. lazy. Yeah, yeah, and that's not something that I think we could have done, right? Like, I, I don't think it makes sense to have that kind of behavior on a regular. You know, we would have to modify nodes or else we would have to do a lot of multicast to make that work on a regular Wi-Fi network. Yeah. So I, I I don't think we could have done exactly what Pascal did in, in the use case that we were trying to address. Um, one of the things that I've been working on in the DNS service discovery working group is um, service registration protocol. So the idea with SRP is, is that um, you, a device when it's got a service to advertise goes out and discovers an SRP server and then registers with it, just like what you're talking about. And that registration is unicast and it's authenticated in a certain way. It's so, so that like if two devices try to claim the same, claim to be the same service, they, the, the one that claims it first wins um, and thereafter presumably gets to keep it. So, so we have ways of solving that particular problem. We don't really have a way of solving the proxy ND problem. Um, so, uh, so I don't think proxy ND is a practical solution for the general case, although it does work for Pascal's particular case. Um, I think that SRP is a practical solution for the general case. Um, so uh, I actually would like to use SRP on home net. Uh, of course, SRP requires a modification on the server. The server has to know to do SRP. So, you know, that's not ideal. Uh, that it's, it's, it, it lacks that nice plug and play quality that multicast DNS gets, but we already have a solution for multicast DNS, which is, uh, the, the DNS SD discovery proxy. So, uh, so if we have legacy devices that don't support SRP, they just use a discovery proxy and life is good. So I think we've got that use case covered in home net. And part of what HNCP lets us do is actually fully populate the the, uh, the zone table for the home network so that so that we really can do service discovery on on the whole home network. Um, and uh, so I, I think, you know, we have a nice rich solution to this problem. Uh, I think I, I, I would really like to see us make more progress on actually getting to the point where the solution is available to end users. Um, and I think one of the ways we can do that is by incrementally moving towards it. Uh, it may be that the that the, uh, the RA reachability solution is a, a, a step in that direction. It may be that putting HNCP on um, on these stub routers is a, is is a is an incremental step in that direction. Because suppose you've got a home network with like a dozen stub routers on it. They're all communicating with each other. It's all working great, but they don't have connectivity to the internet and service discovery doesn't work as well as you'd like it to because of, you know, because you don't have a central uh, network. So wouldn't it be nice to uh, buy a home router that supports HNCP, right? Uh, and now suddenly you have full service discovery and you have, um, you have full routability and your network gets noticeably better because you have because you bought an edge a customer edge router a home router that has home net in it whereas before you know like right now if you go out and buy a, a home router with hncp in it first of all you've committed a miracle but secondly um you don't actually get any benefit from that because you're just buying one router so you don't see any change on in the way your network behaves by buying that router there's no there's no killer app uh, until you have a second home router and that solution that that's our that problem's already been solved with mesh networks, so we don't really we we don't have a competitive advantage there. Um, but even if you have a mesh network, like if you have if you have a Wi-Fi mesh, 
uh, like an Eero mesh or, Ed. you know, one of the others. Yeah. Um, uh, this is really interesting, but I, but I think you're animated and when you're talking and you're moving away from your microphone and so you kind of fade into nothingness for a little bit and then you come back loud. Oh, no. I think you're moving your head around and your microphone's not moving. So half of what you're saying is really hard to hear. I apologize. It's interesting. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, I'm trying to hold my head still. Yeah, the audio wasn't too bad for me. It was, it was acceptable. Uh, I, I guess I have a question, Ted. Um, where, 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 where do you think the working group should be going with this? How do we establish that there is a bunch of other people and not just Ted and Michael who would like to pursue something? And, they, well, um, and, and just as a time check, we've got like uh, 15 minutes left. So if other people on the on the call want to jump in the queue, then please do so now. So yeah. So I I don't know the answer to the to the uh, um, the enthusiasm question right now. Um, I think that the, I mean the reason why I'm talking about this is because I'm curious. I mean we don't actually have a huge number of people here, so I think. Um, terms of next steps, probably I need to write up a draft that says what I just said um, and uh, and publish that. I don't even know for sure that HomeNet is the place to do this, although I kind of think it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I think that would be the way to go, because I think at this point, uh, as you say, we really don't know if anybody else even recognizes that this is a problem. And, uh, you know, when I've discussed this Elsewhere, it, I, I, I think a lot of people don't really, a lot of people think this is already a solved problem. And I, I think if, if more people were aware that it really isn't a solved problem, we might get a little more interest in solving it. So nobody wants to solve a solved problem. And Michael, could I ask you to um, state the thing you wrote in the minutes, just so that it legitimately belongs in the minutes? Okay, so I thought that Ted's uh, RA um, uh, problem is an interesting thing, and I think he's right that there may be some interesting failure cases that we don't understand. And so my thought was that it it needs to it, that it, it would be an interest. I think it would be an interesting uh, graduate or fourth year project for for somebody to go through this. Um, and uh, I guess Stevens disagreed in chat. But um, that's my opinion. That it would okay. be interesting to have someone figure it out and decide, figure out whether it really works or not. Yep. Stephen, back to you then. Okay, so uh, it sounds like then, Ted, you're volunteering to write a draft or send an email uh, trying to figure out how to drum up enthusiasm and enthusiasm for solving this and for where it might be solved yep the action, yeah that's what i'm saying okay uh and given that there's nobody else in the queue i think that moves us to the any other business part of the agenda in which case is there any other business that somebody wants to raise if you'd like to do that just jump in add yourself to the, to the mic line So I'm not seeing anybody immediately join. Uh, Barbara, I think that's, if, if that remains the case, I think that brings us to the end of the agenda. Yep. Eric, did you have anything you wanted to say as our illustrious AD? Yeah, thank you, Barbara. This is Rick Vink here. Uh, I follow this question about that draft, and indeed it should be written into an ID so we can see uh, whether people are interested and maybe move it into another working group. Um, with a question mark behind. So that if you don't mind writing and putting your IDs in an ID and then ask for some review, that would be superb. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think regardless of where this goes, it needs to be seen by people in, you know, who are interested in six man and maybe V6 ops. So um, I don't know that that's where it should land, but I think, I think there is a home net specific use case here, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, that's, that's my plan. Yeah, at least start by uh, putting things on an ID. That's, that's the first step, as you know. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you in advance, by the way. Interesting. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, and with still nobody in the queue, I think that brings us to the end of the meeting and we recover 11 minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, all right. so thank you all. And uh, you never know, we might see each other in Madrid. But you never know. <laughs> Take care. Open the bed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay thank Stephen. You all. I, we'll always have Singapore. So. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have something in the future. There's, there's optimism to be had. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, thanks all for your time and uh, see you on the list. Thanks. Sure.